I'm so excited to have Javon Jackson on the Everything Saxophone podcast. He was a special request from one of our super fans, Laura. Thanks so much for being here, Javon. Good to be with you and congrats on the success of your uh, podcast. Thank you so much. And, you know, um, I'm so inspired by all the things that you've done. You've performed with so many different people in wide ranges of musical categories. Um, this is going to be very interesting, actually. But what I want to do, I love asking this because I, I like to get into how people got started and how, you know, their beginning mentors and their inspirations, you know, led them along their career path. So how did you get started in music? Um, it may not have been on the saxophone. It could have been on piano or something like that. I'm just really curious. Right. Well, I had parents who uh, were avid music listeners. So I heard a lot of uh, jazz and you might say R&B, that kind of stuff in my home as a young person. And so uh, hearing it, I naturally kind of gravitated to uh, jazz music. And when I began to play the saxophone around 10 or 11, my father always played lots of Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt. So uh, among other uh, musicians, but he listened, his favorite saxophones was Gene Ammons. So that became my first person that I say put on a microscope. And then from there, there were other uh, musicians and other uh, artists I was listening to. And then I, they would take me out to clubs and let me sit in and stuff like that. Once they saw that I had an interest and I was beginning to develop as a, a young a musician. So my parents were, uh, really critical for my success because they took me out to see uh, famous artists when they would come to town. My father took me to see Sonny Stitt when I was maybe 13 or 14. Then later after that, he took me to see Dexter Gordon. I got to see the Modern Jazz Quartet. A lot of artists during that time, Ray Brown. <clears throat> so those things were so inspirational as a young person. And so it got me more and more into the idea that uh, I wanted to be a professional jazz uh, musician. Wow, since an early age, th that's so interesting. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Denver, Colorado. Okay, interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the bands I'm in right now, actually, she, her name is Margaret. Her stage name is Margaret Love. She's from Denver, Colorado. Uh, we're out in L.A. right now. So that so it must have been a really great scene at the time, and I, I'm assuming now too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, people wouldn't necessarily think that Denver had a, a jazz scene, but it definitely did. There were clubs to go to, musicians to talk to and spend time with and learn from. So uh, it was a good environment for a young person like myself. I get to go in and sit in and maybe play one song and then go sit back down and go home and work on that song, come back the next time. And so, right, it was a, it was a, a fertile ground and uh, uh, encouraging uh, opportunities and, and clubs with musicians who were willing to share. That's really cool. Now, let me ask you something. Did When did you start taking, if you did, um, you know, private lessons? I mean, you said you started uh, saxophone at the age of 10, so I'm going to assume that was in schools. Um, and, you know, how did it work out in terms of your your teacher mentors? Right. Well, my uh, father would come up and, 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 again, he wasn't a musician. We just loved the music. But he would come up and say, hey, I hear you. He'd hear me practicing whatever I was playing in the fourth grade, Mary had a little lamb or whatever songs I might have been playing. He'd come up and he said, Hey, can you learn, can you play some of this? And then he'd hand me a Gene Ammons record. So then I'd put on the record and slowly try to pick out notes and stuff like that. And he didn't know what he was doing. He just wanted to see if I could play the things that he was listening to. So then later in, uh, as I got to uh, middle school or junior high, then it got suggested to me by the band director that I get some private lessons. So then I started to take private lessons with, um, a person in Denver's name is Keith Oxman. I started taking lessons with him, say, I don't know, 14 or 15. And that uh, continued until I graduated. But at that time, I was playing the alto saxophone. And the tenor came much later as a senior in high school, just before the year uh, from prior to me graduating. That's when I switched to the tenor saxophone. And what, um, where did you go to college? I went to Berkeley College of Music. Okay. And let me ask you this question, too. Um, you know, what, which saxophone, you know, you know, we all tend to play multiple saxophones, but, you know, you mostly played uh, alto at that point, you, you started to play some tenor, you know, which was your main, main saxophone at Berkeley, unless you, you did double duty on both? Well, what happened as a senior in Denver, there was a citywide uh, combo group, if you will, and there was already an alto saxophonist in the group. So the only way I could be in the group, I had to play the tenor saxophone. So actually I didn't even own one. My private teacher, uh, Keith Oxman loaned me 
his tenor saxophone to play for uh, during that time period because I didn't own a tenor. Oh, wow. So then um, I think I had a summer job working for an airline or something like that. And then I saved the money by, you know, loading airplanes and stuff like that, working for an airline to buy my own saxophone. So when I got to Berkeley, it was all tenor. I never looked back once I started playing tenor as a senior. And uh, actually prior to that, I was, I should say, I was at University of uh, Denver for a really brief time, but due to um, some conversations with Branford, Marcellus and encouragement from him and his, uh, his younger brother, who's my age, Delphio, they really encouraged me to come to Berkeley because I wanted, I had this dream of playing with our Blakey at that time, even before I met them. And the best opportunity for that was to get to, to, to Berkeley so that I could be in the Northeast and, and, and meet someone like Art Blakey and get that opportunity. So then everything shifted. And so that's when I went to Berkeley. How did, okay, wow. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. So how did you, you know, you're in Denver. How did you meet Branford and Del Feo? Well, Delfio and uh, myself were both in the McDonald's All-American Band as seniors. You audition for it and they take two uh, students from each state in the United States. And so when we got to uh, 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 New York City, I'm sorry, to march in the uh, Macy's Day Parade, I was already aware of Winton and Branford because they were playing with R. Blakey at the time. So in my mind, I wanted to, to uh, meet them because I wanted to play with R. Blakey. That was the burning goal. Well, when I met Delphio, we were introducing ourselves and we saw you know, other uh, uh, faces that looked like ours. I went over and introduced myself and he said, my name is Delphia Marsalis. And I said, well, are you Branford's brother? He said, yeah, he's going to be here. And he came over to the rehearsal, the marching band rehearsal, he and Winton. And so that's when I met Branford. He was uh, really gracious then as he is now. We stayed in touch. And when he came to Denver later in the year, he came over to my house and, and we got to practice together and he got to help me out with some lessons and stuff. And then I let him know my goals. And so then he suggested that I, I go to Berkeley. That's an awesome story. Um, I have to ask, this is interesting. Do you believe in like power of like visualization and all that kind of stuff? Because, you know, you had this goal, you wanted to play with Art Blakey, and then we know we know it came to fruition. So I don't know, I'm just, I don't know if I'm in left field by asking that, but. No, I very much believe in that aspect of uh, sending it out to the universe and then allowing the universe to uh, give you the opportunity you're asking for. So you got to ask for something to get something. So I'm a big believer in one year goals, five year goals, 10 year goals, uh, writing that stuff down. I, I do believe there's a lot of uh, 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 reality in that for me. So it, it definitely worked into something that I am um, very, maybe what you call spiritual, spiritually minded in that way that you tend to get what you ask for or what you don't ask for. When did you start to believe in that or start to, to realize that? Well, I guess as things started to come to fruition, I, I'm 14. I said, look, after seeing Sonny Stitt, I think at 13, I said, I want to do what he does. I want to live in New York and travel all the world and play the saxophone. So I started to go down to clubs and talk to musicians. And then my folks had a, a really interesting collection of music, but they had One Night at Berlin, which is our Blakey record on the back. He talked about keeping these musicians until they got too old and he would get some new ones. And I thought that was odd. Then I started doing research and realized that Art Blakey's life mission was giving young musicians the opportunity. So then Art Blakey became the, the direction of my goals of playing in New York and travel over the world. Well, let's do it with Art Blakey. So it was something that I kind of kept to myself. I shared to some people, but it was definitely a vision and goal. So everything that kind of uh, happened in that way to me uh, supported my beliefs. But at the same time, you still have to be doing the work so that you're ready. So whether you put a monetary price on what you want or whether you say, look, I wanna be in the top whatever percentile of the artists or the music or the business sector of what I choose, then that's part of that process or goal. And then the spiritual aspect will take care of itself. But then the other side of it is the person or persons who are looking for those opportunities have to do the work. So then that's where they say luck, plus opportunity equals, or luck plus preparation equals opportunity. They say it like that. So you have to do the prepared part too. Let me, and work. Okay, so this was gonna be, you know, uh, my next question too. 
what was the type of work aside from, you know, your, your dad giving you this Gene Ammons record and say, Hey, can you figure this out? But, you know, I could already tell that you're starting to learn things by ear in addition to, you know, doing stuff at school. What was mm-hmm. the type of work that you put in at the age of like 13 and 14? What were the types of things, if you could remember, you know, that you were working on? Uh, just the basic things that the, 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 uh, I was getting in school, whether it was, um, uh, repertoire, if I was in a, uh, maybe a, a large symphony ensemble, if I was in a jazz band. But then at home, I really was learning and ruining a lot of my dad's records by taking that needle back and forth and learning solo. So I think that helped me strengthen my ear so that I could hear things because I find a lot of students now, they go right to a transcription as opposed to letting their ear do the work for them. Because as you know, um, you have to see with your ears. As our Blakey would say, see with your ears and hear with your eyes. So I think that this music or music in general is an oral art form. So you really have to strengthen your ear. And uh, so I was learning a lot of solos. And also I did things that don't seem that uh, unique now, but I would try to sing all the solos on a recording. I remember I was, uh, my father had uh, the record Sidewinder. And so my goal, I would go to bed with the with the music and my goal was to sing every one solo. So the melody, Lee Morgan solo, Joe Henderson solo, Barry Harris's solo, Bob Cranshaw solo, and then the song out. I wanted to, I mean, with all the pitches, I wanted to be right with with those uh, instruments as best I could. So I did that a lot. And then obviously you listen to vocalists and you try to later try to uh, mimic their words and, and their inflection and the way that they uh, maybe speak a link, uh, speak a, uh, a lyric. So all that kind of stuff helped me. And I still think that's an important aspect of, of the music is having strong ears. Yeah, you know, you, you said before, uh, too, you know, a lot of people will tend to default to the transcription first. And, you know, what, what I always say to my students, too, like, what you see on that page is not what they're playing. You know, there's not only is there so much more to it, but you just can't accurately reflect. Um, certainly, not, number one, the, rhythm, the rhythms. You know, people may lay back, they may anticipate, or whatever. Um, and if anybody was able to notate the exact rhythms that people are playing, we go blind trying to look at that because it's just, it just, you know, it's just too much. But um, just trying to capture, uh, just it, well, music is an oral experience, you know, and you can't really capture that on paper. But sure. um, I think that for a lot of us who were trained in schools to read first, you know, it's like that's the default, unfortunately. Right. And I think listening, it really allows you to love it. I always say that you got to love this music. You don't have to like it. You got to love it. I think to really to um, stay with it for the time period that we're in it for the grind or the everyday aspect of it, it's got to be a way of life, as Cannibal Alley said, not a not a state of mind. So you got to wake up thinking about it. You got to you got to that's got to be your religion. You got to live by it. And I think that a lot of musicians, younger musicians, have to focus on making sure they love it. They love the ups and downs of it and the, and what it takes to, to have a career in this business. And um, I don't see, you can, if you don't love it, I don't see how you can, I don't see you can be successful in anything if you don't, at a certain point, love it. Yeah, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go off in a different direction right now, uh, based on what you're saying. Um, if you don't love something, it makes it really hard. You know, you've had you've had a, an awesome career so far. And what have you seen in terms of changes? A jazz musician, you, you were you know, you were talking to people at clubs at the ages of 13, 14 and stuff. You've seen, you know, uh, at, at a certain degree of what went on back then to what's going on now. Um, you know, that that there's definitely been changes for sure. You, can you talk about that? And, you know, the fact that, you know, how you really need to love this because of, you know, I think the changes that have happened. Right. Well, I mean, like in today's world, the 21st century musician, look at the medium that we're in now. Um, it's a lot different. You have a cell phone, which didn't occur in the uh, 20th century. So that cell phone is uh, social media. So a lot of these things are good, but they're time consuming. YouTube. So if you're not careful, any of us can be on YouTube for 45 minutes uh, without even blinking, just looking at different things that might pop up. And then at the end of the day, we say, oh, we don't have enough time. We don't have enough time in the day. No, you have time. Can you budget? And that hasn't changed. 
So to be organized, I think you have to get up early. I think you uh, really have to get to it uh, when you're really fresh and you have to be as consistent as you can. And you have to be honest with yourself about what you can and cannot do. And you have to seek uh, information, uh, the humility necessary, all those things, those things have not changed. Uh, the idea that it has to be one on one. You cannot really practice with a group of people. You cannot really develop with a group of people. You have to play music with people, but you have to come to the realization that you're going to be practicing far more in your life than you're going to be performing. That's true. And, and, and bottom line. Yeah. yeah. And having to love it too, having to love to do this type of work. And, and in speaking of, of practicing and stuff, so you've gone through school, you know, you, you, uh, learned all these solos by ear and singing them. That's so awesome. And not even just saxophone solos, everybody's solos, including the melody. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just a, a whole education in and of itself that you get to Berkeley. Who did, who were your teachers at Berkeley? Well, I went to Berkeley at that point again, Branford said, you need to go to Berkeley and study with Billy Pierce. So I knew about Billy Pierce because he had played with Art Blake and the Jazz Messenger. So I went there to study with Billy, although I didn't really get to study with him right away. They were because he didn't have that many uh, saxophonists that he would take on. So it, my trek to him got a little different. First, it started with a gentleman named Andy McGee, who was a great uh, saxophonist. Then I got Mr. Joe Viola, which was uh, Joe Viola was really, really critical to uh, the Berkeley College of Music. And then later I got to Berkeley just before I joined Art Blakey. I mean, I got to Billy Pierce, I'm sorry, just before I joined Art Blakey. So I didn't really get to spend a lot of time with him then, although we became, you know, lifelong friends. And I consider him a, a, like a, a brother, a, a really a, a mentor of sorts. So it, as you would say, sometimes you think that you have the answer or how it's going to go and it usually doesn't go that way so you have to be prepared and flexible that your path to success will not be a straight line it's probably going to be a squiggly line it's going to be to the right to the right back to the left back to the left all the way to the left and over to the left and up a little bit back to the right it doesn't really go straight up right so you have to be uh, prepared for the ebb and flow of this process and so again you have to you have to fall in love with the process i mean you got to berkeley and I used to love the practice at, say, 11, 12, 1 o'clock. Well, you got school. Then on the days when you don't have school, all of the um, practice rooms may be full. Mm -hmm. So thanks to Delphio, um, being a late night owl, I became one. And we start practicing together maybe 2 in the morning because wow. no one was in the dorms. Well, then now that's translated to me still being an early riser because it's just kind of become muscle memory to get up and as you know, if you get up at five or five thirty and get started, before you know it, it's nine or ten, and then you have responsibilities. If you're at the university, like I am, or you are, so then all of a sudden your day's uh, gone. So I need to have that in the morning. I feel like it uh, lowers my blood pressure. So I forget to practice <laughs> before I get to school. Whereas that's kind of a joke. But if you don't get to practice, or you don't get to maybe exercise or something like that, I feel out of balance with myself. So that's important for me to try it as much as I can, or even if I get up and I just listen to music, or if I read something that is keeps me away from the phone, away from TV, because those things are addictive. I'm not going to get into whether they're good or bad today, but they take away from your opportunity to really focus in on your craft. And I, I, uh, I see it a lot when you, you're on the plane and a person's next to me, and they have the film on, you know, in their, in, in their, the TV's on, but they're reading the phone. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so it's, it, the phone, it, it, you're, you're, you're conflicted because you're always saying, what am I going to miss? I'm going to miss this email or what else is going on? Or let me check this app or let me, and it's a time consuming thing. And so um, I read this in a book that uh, if you get up in the morning and the first thing you do is look at your phone. And if you look at the phone, if that's the last thing you do before you go to bed, you're addicted. Yeah. You know, it's so funny you said the word addicted because in my head, that's that's the word that's screaming out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, it's it's it this the, the phone is an addiction. Um yes. it's just crazy. But um and and you know, what's also striking me too is that you know you're sharing this information with your students. You're the director of jazz of jazz studies at uh Jackie McLean, director of jazz studies at Heart School of Music. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm sure that you speak about this often with your students. 
I try to write the Jackie McLean Institute of Jazz Studies. I try to talk to them about it. Of course, they have their own thoughts on it and their own uh, ideas. So some of it might register, some of it may not. I might say, if you can't get a metronome that's not connected to your phone. Mm. Why? Because your phone doesn't need to be near you because if you see a text, you might be prone to see what that text is. All of a sudden, you've lost your um, momentum regarding the practice. So if you have a separate, if the phone is separate, or if you can do something just to, to, to limit, because when you go on stage, you don't take the phone with you. So you have to um, prepare yourself for what, although I know there are people now who read music and they use iPads and phones. And so a lot of that stuff is the way of the future. So I'm not, I'm not knocking that, but I still think there's a balance there where you should be able to do something without wondering uh, what's going to occur. Because if you probably didn't look at the phone for a whole day, you probably wouldn't miss anything. Yeah. I mean, you might miss a few emails, but it's nothing that couldn't wait, is my point. So, um, and if it was that important, uh, versus a phone call versus checking the email is what I'm saying. It's, you know, having a phone call is one thing where there's an emergency, whereas just checking email a lot of it is, I mean, now we all get so much uh, ad material that really has nothing to do with emails and things. It's just other kind of stuff that now the internet uh, makes us susceptible to. Yeah. And, you know, just as like kind of a, a related topic to this too, um, I wonder if, you know, you've, you've been teaching for quite a while too. And if you've noticed, well, the students that are, you know, um, coming to college now only have been born knowing cell phones. I mean, that's not my situation. Um, but uh, the distraction of it, you know, um, I'm wondering, you know, like the, I'll use the word quality of the student, but like thinking of the quality of the student in the nineties versus quality of the students now, I mean, you know, students are, are, are um, tech, you know, technically probably really incredibly good, but I just wonder if like this distraction you know, and not even just from a phone, but, you know, just the whole social media idea and, and getting hooked on YouTube and this and that, how that's affected. Have you seen changes, you know, in your students from when you first started teaching to, to now? Right. I think more and more, especially I'll look at I me mean, when I was a young person that um, once an older person told me to do something, for the most part, I just did it. I never really challenged if somebody said, hey, go home and, and practice your upbeats, I just go home and do it. Or you need to practice on long tones or uh, you need to work on the lower part of your instrument and go do this exercise. I just go home and do it. Nowadays, in some ways, you give a student information, which is free. Information is free. I always say people say, oh, nothing is free. Yes, information is free sometimes. But the student will second guess or challenge the information as opposed to just Go put it on a microscope and see what happens. So I can't tell you how many times that, you know, Art Blakey would have said, and I'm not Art Blakey, but I'm saying the idea when someone's older than you gives you information, they have experience, just go do it. Just go try it. But I think sometimes there's a certain amount of, I don't want to say entitlement, but there's a certain sense of, uh, I think I might know what I need to do better than someone else can tell me what to do. And at that age, I mean, you're where you are, your best efforts have you where you are. <laughs> so so that you may grow and so that you may learn. I think if, if sometimes I just think a little bit uh, more humility uh, and just a willingness to appreciate. But again, you go on the internet and you've got 15 different uh, answers to your question. So then when you touch somebody else, well, no, I don't, I already heard somebody else saying I like their, uh, uh, maybe strategy better than what I'm hearing as opposed to just putting them all down on the table and looking at them and see what comes from those uh, suggestions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, with the, the tie in with this, which is very interesting, getting back to Art Blakey, right, and getting back to the jazz masters who would take on younger players, right, and mentor them. And, you know, when when they're mentoring the younger players, whatever era you want to talk about, those younger players would do, would listen to everything that their, men, their mentor said, you know. And so it's it's almost um, it's not a stark contrast, but it's it's 
you know, it's a foreshadowing of, of what may, you know, continue, I guess, to happen in a sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it just comes from, again, upbringing. If my father just said, do something, I just did it. Whether I liked it or not until I got to a certain age, even still, when I got older, he told me to do something because he's my father. So you just kind of respected that um, authority and, and, and the wisdom that you were getting. I, the first time I was fortunate to meet Sonny Rollins, I went up to him and I said, Sonny, I just want to let you know you're my hero. And he said, I appreciate that. But have you checked out Chew Berry? Oh, how interesting. You know, go listen to Chew Berry, man. Please, I appreciate it. But go listen to Chew Berry. So I went and got Chew Berry. I said, oh, my God, don't stand a ghost of a chance. So then when I talked to him, thank you. Because sometimes there's a, he appreciated it, but Sonny, the incredible artist he is, he uh, sometimes the uh, adulation, he, he just um, he doesn't want to hear it. But it's OK, too. I still love him. He knows that. But the idea of him saying, go check out Chew Berry or Go check out Don Byers playing uh, How High the Moon or these other incredible artists, obviously Coleman Hawkins playing uh, Body and Soul. So we go back and we listen to all these incredible renditions and all these incredible um, uh, masterpieces of, of soloing. And we realize there's so much to be gotten from. And I think that's the other thing is now that the musicians sometimes in this sphere we're talking about don't really go back because um, we all have to go back. There's so much back there for us to learn and bring forward. If you're looking at the period we're talking right now, like the swing era, yeah, yeah. because a lot of the musicians start maybe from the bebop era forward, but in the swing area, era, excuse me, and definitely the traditional era, era, there's so much stuff that we could deal with in those areas. Finally got that word out right. But these different places that we can really spend time in. So, for example, when I was with Art Blakey, I really wasn't past the mid fifties, I just was kind of living there. And then I began to work with other artists and then you move forward. Obviously, if I started working with Elvin I, Jones, I'd move a little forward, but I was kind of, I appreciated that period of time of those saxophonists say from the forties and fifties. And, um, you know, just to say that those, those artists there's so many great saxophonists from that period that I feel that uh, musicians in this instance, saxophonists, but, all instrumentalists could put it under a microscope. Yeah, this let's let's dive into this too, and this is going to go into some of the um, some of the other questions I had for you as well. So, as a as a teacher, as a mentor, right? You have young students coming in. You know, when I mean young, I don't mean like you know thirteen, fourteen years old. I mean like college age and stuff. Right. You know what? Who do you tell them to listen to? You know, and like how do you steer them from the start? Right. I suggest certain names to them. But I always want a person to to emulate or to begin to uh, put on a microscope the folks that they like. So it's kind of hard for me to go, hey, uh, Donna, you play tenor saxophone. I think you need to like Lucky Thompson or I think you need to like Ben Webster. Not so much that as I just offer those names and the one that speaks to you, then we allow you to go through that individual. But as a person, I can look at you now and full blown and say, well, Donna is Donna, but people that know you from when you, where you grew up, they say, well, Donna definitely comes from this part of her personality comes from her mom. This part comes from her father. This part comes from her uncle aunts. Right? So we come from something, but at a certain point, you who you are, what's the same thing with the music. You have to come from something or you're not part of the family. I mean, in other genres or other uh, types of music to be a part of the family, it's a badge of honor to say if if uh, uh, someone say uh, 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 Mo's deaf, it's an honor for him to say what rappers he is uh, influenced by or what musicians he's influenced by. But sometimes jazz musicians say, well, no, I don't want to be influenced by anybody. I just want to just do my own thing, which is kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's like saying. As a human being, you just all of a sudden just showed up on the scene full blown and nobody influenced you. That's silly. But is this uh, sometimes this uh, uh, denial that jazz music really has this evolution and that there's not a process to having uh, a certain level of uh, ability that is almost uh, esoteric. And it kind of does a disservice to all of the hardworking artists and there's thousands and millions of them out there right from art tatum to uh, anybody you might want to name clifford brown or all these incredible artists up to a wenton marcellus just to say that 
they just woke up one day and were good. It 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 kind of um it marginalizes what we do. Yeah, and it's it's I'd like to use the analogy, you know, um you have to build the the foundation of the house before you can go to the penthouse. You can't go to the penthouse because there's nothing there's nothing there to support it. You know, um, so that, that's a that's a great way of, of looking at that. And, you know, I mean, yeah, we talked about YouTube and there's there's so much. The, the bad thing about YouTube is you can get sucked in to the black hole of YouTube and, you know, watching a million videos. The, the good thing is that um, unlike when we were growing up, you know, we'd have to, you know, find a record store or find a library that would have an album um, mm -hmm. or those record clubs that you'd buy <laughs> the Sony record clubs. Oh my God. I just remember that. But anyway, you just go to YouTube and you could look, look up something and get, you know, instant, uh, gratification and listening to, you know, favorite artists and stuff like that. That's, that's one really good aspect of that. But, um, you know, I think, I think it's the, on the opposite side of that, the instant gratification also can be a, a detriment as well, because people may not, you know, may not, be exposed to you know foundational artists that uh you know they should be listening to just to get an experience of you know where the music came from and sometimes with a recording it's really great to spend time with the entire recording as it was kind of uh, created in that period whereas you might say let's look at john coltrane and say well i'm gonna listen to john coltrane play um blue train they listen to blue train in 1957 they listen to that maybe eight times. Then all of a sudden they say, well, let me listen to John Coltrane playing with Miles, uh, Freddie Freeloader. That's 1959. And then they listen to that for maybe 15 times. And then they say, okay, well, let me listen to John Coltrane playing a resolution on uh, 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 A Love Supreme. I think that was in 63. So all of a sudden they, there's three different recordings. They listen to three different recordings but what about the entirety of that one recording on Blue Train? How much have they really put the entire recording under the microscope? There's a lot of music in that one recording with all those various artists. Then you go to Blue, then you go to Kind of Blue, and how much time can you get from that one recording? So sometimes they're moving on, people are moving on without really getting what the scope of that day was like when they were in a studio. So if we record something, in that one day or that time period it took to, to create that those um the, the the music and the compositions to put that under the microscope so you tend to move to the end of the story very quickly without really getting the best out of each chapter mm. in my opinion because they don't have to listen to the you don't listen to it track one track two track three you just hear something you move on to something you move on to something and you've got students i've got students who um, no, a uh, vast amount of Coltrane on impulse. But if I say, hey, are you familiar with John Coltrane's big band record that he was on in Bethlehem in, say, 56, 56 they don't know it. Or Coltrane uh, recording on Savoy Records with uh, Wilbur Harden in 57 with Tommy Flanning and Lewis Hayes and Doug Watkins. They don't know it because it's only kind of the way what they've been told or what the, gets the most hits mm. on YouTube. And that's what I mean. Sometimes you have to seek information from some of the elders and they'll give you some other little uh, pieces of wisdom. And and speaking on that too. So um, I'm going to dive back to you, right? And how did you get that opportunity to meet Art Blakey and then work with him? Right. Well, when I got to Berkeley, again, trying to uh, study with uh, Billy Pierce at that time, I didn't get to study with him. But I got to make friendships with him. And the uh, uh, friendship that I had at the, began at that time, which was paramount to me getting a chance to uh, audition, was a, a pianist named Donald Brown, who was teaching at Berkeley. So when I got to Berkeley, I met Donald, who was an, uh, a professor there, and I was around him morning, noon, and night, seemingly. Anytime he had a performance, I would hang out with him or I would follow him and spend time with him. And then James Williams was still living in Boston at the time. So um, I was around these musicians getting uh, stories and wisdom about New York City and things like that. But also um, as the opportunity came when the tenor saxophonist at that time with Art Blakey stepped away, John Toussaint, uh, Donald made me aware and Donald taught me some of the, the material that they were playing. And so then I went down and auditioned. I got the audition at the end of the night um, on something that I was comfortable with, which was rhythm changes. 
So I uh, got to audition on r- rhythm changes, and then he asked me to come back the next night, and then I got hired. But it was a it was a club uh, in the uh, in the nineties called McHale's in in, in in the city, so New York City in the nineties. I think it was ninety third in Columbus, but the club was called McHale's. All right, cool. And so you passed the audition, right? Mm-hmm. And then you started to work with him right away. And what what was that like for you? You know, um, I I mean, I'm just thinking you visualize this from a young age. And then here you are, and your dream's coming true. Right, and so it was like saying that, uh, he told me, um, this is like going from high school to Harvard, because he heard that I was going to Berkeley. He said, you're going to Berkeley? He said, well, this is Harvard. <laughs> so it was unbelievable, because um, there were a lot of things that I just wasn't ready for musically, and then traveling, and, and uh, just the rate of uh, the way the music we were playing, traveling a lot, and there were some incredible musicians in the band that um, it was a challenge just to be on stage with them. Uh, uh, Kenny Garrett was the alto saxophonist, was a very close friend at that time. Uh, Wallace Roney got rest his soul. Donald Brown was the pianist. Um, Peter Washington was the bassist. So uh, it was a, a band of really strong musicians. And then various musicians would come in from time to time just to see art and would sit in so um everybody from elvin jones charlie hayden to uh walter davis jr anybody you can imagine uh, don cherry would just come <laughs> and sit in with the jazz messengers so that was a, 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 a maybe an added degree of of pressure but it was never really from art because uh he was always encouraging musicians and he uh, was supportive he just wanted you in his in his words to be swinging and to be working on your instrument. That was his uh, couple of mantras was to to be dedicated to the craft and 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 swing your tail off is what he would uh, kind of allude to. And uh, that was uh, the, the any pressure was more well the pressure of being in the messengers because every young musician was looking to be in the messengers. But the other pressure was I think I just put on myself because. Well, Wayne Shorter was in the band. I'll never be Wayne Shorter, which is true. Or uh, uh, Benny Golson was in the band. I'll never be our, um, Benny Golson. And those kind of pressures I put on myself. And I remember one day Art um, asked me, he'd like to play. Uh, it was original that Wayne had written and played a long time, at, at some, time some years ago before myself, obviously. It was called Children of the Night. And I said, oh, man, Children of the Night, Wayne Shorter. He said, well, don't worry about that. That's why you're here. Um, I don't want you to be Wayne. I just want to play um, one of his pieces. But my point being is that he was supportive and he never really wanted anyone to sound like anyone. He wanted everybody to be themselves. And if you look at the types of musicians, there were uh, varying styles, various styles that played in the messengers, but he was supportive of the different styles and, and the different way musicians uh, play because he was a unique musician himself and he was never pigeonholed that he was a prototype of anybody. He was Art Blakey. So I, I think that was something that was very uh, 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 helpful to me as a musician. Yeah, you know, and you, you just answered my question. I was going to ask you what were some of the biggest things you know that that art conveyed to you um and you already said it you know basically swing your tail off and and be your basically be yourself um and not be intimidated you know by all these other artists i i'm curious you know if you could remember back when you know in that experience how did you though you know emotionally handle that you know a lot of people would would um most people don't talk about this you know they talk about get, getting your skills up and all that kind of thing and that's so important but there is that emotional aspect there's that mental aspect that you know for some people they could just be be um torn apart by stage fright and all that kind of thing um or just you know overwhelmed by um uh you know you're in the jazz messengers you know what i mean just the prominence of that how did you handle that well all of that what you mentioned sometimes um feeling that you're not up to snuff or uh you're uh worried about uh, you know how you may sound how you may look to the audience or uh it's never good enough because you go home and you put on the sonny rollins record or charlie parker or these other individuals i'll never add up to that you're right but it's pressure that as an individual we uh individuals we put on ourselves so the idea was more and more reading helps me reading just to 
feel like you are fine just the way you are. And so every day it gets a little better and every day you become a little more confident. And I always say the best thing to help confidence is practice. Yeah. <laughs> so the more you practice, the more confident you are that you can play F major scale because you've been practicing it. And you, when it's time to uh, you play it, you can do that from the time that you spend on the instrument. So I always feel that that was part of it is that um, certain aspects of it, you weren't fine tuning in a comprehensive fashion. And those always tend to show up on you on stage. If you're not really practicing in D, somewhere or another, a song will come up in the key of D. <laughs> <laughs> so the best way to do it is practicing all keys, which I was, but you still might put a little bit more time in F, a little bit concert or B flat concert or whatever. And then when that D shows up or D flat or A or E, the guitar players are ready, but they were not ready. So it, it, it's something that we all go through uh, confidence. Some people have just more natural confidence than others, and some a little bit more shy. I was a, I'm a tall person, so I always felt like people are looking at me and because I stand out being tall. So um, am I doing anything that looks strange or, you know, your, your, your stage presence or you know, Art was really good at um, making each one of the musicians from time to time grab the microphone and talk to the audience. Because in the beginning, no one really uh, feels like they can get up and speak to an audience and feel comfortable. So the things that I can do now in this way, talk talking to you, pretty uh, normal. It wasn't always like that, but more reps and more opportunities. So I tell the young people, Anytime you have the opportunity to work on your communication skills, do it. It's very important to develop your ability to pontificate and your ability to uh, speak and communicate clearly and in a way that uh, uh, lets people know that you have some sense. Uh, and I think sometimes um, slang is good, but it's not always necessary or it's not always um, appreciated in certain areas. So today, we having this conversation. There's some of uh, Javon's lingo, but by and large, we're going to speak in a way that um, uh, makes uh, good intelligent sense. And so I think that young people have to think about that. Well, I'm just going to be me. Well, that's fine. But in certain environments, uh, me might not get the outcome that you might think you can get. So that's all part of maturization. Yeah, knowing your environment, definitely knowing your environment. You know, and 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 you know what I'm I'm curious about too, the environment of of you know touring with a band and you know Art Blakey saying you know I want you to be yourself but you've got to you know I want you to swing your tail off but also work on your instrument. How were you able to you know if you're especially touring and stuff like that? How did you find the time, you know, the necessary time to work on your instrument, being busy and on and on tour and especially you know being with Art Blakey for the first time you know, uh, managing that. Wow. In some of those situations, you find that uh, the practicing will just be on a night to night basis. If you're on a bus for 10 hours and you get two or three hours to get to the hotel and shower and turn around and get your clothes ready for that night, you might not get it that evening. But the next day, if you have a day off, um, then you might be able to get to an instrument in a longer period of time. But however you can, every day is the best way. So if you can find 30 minutes to 45 minutes, it's just like brushing your teeth. You have to find time to do that. So you have to find time to play scales or some kind of fundamental aspect of what we do on our instruments. But you're right. It can be um, challenging to get an amount of time. So that's when, when you're off, then you can really uh, jump in and try to develop uh, in a way that uh, makes sense. But when you're traveling, it, it you just have to do the best you can in, in hotel rooms or uh, early in the, at the at the um, at the sound check, or maybe after if the people are still leaving, uh, maybe you can find somewhere to stay and hang out. But but then you got to go because they have dinner prepared for you, a meal for the band, so you have to leave. So it's um it's um it's a unique um, tightrope you have to walk. 
Yeah, for sure. And I'm just thinking, you know, you were talking about practicing and stuff, and I wanted to get to um, some of the questions from Superfan Laura, who uh, supports the show and who had met you. Um, she said, I saw him play with Joanne Brackeen about three to four years ago at a Rotary fundraiser. I'm assuming this is in Connecticut because that's where she's from. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to get to the questions that she had over here. Um, she wants to know what your own practice routine is like, and I'm going to expand upon that, what it's like now compared to, you know, I'm not going to say college, but maybe, and maybe not even, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about touring with Art Blakey and stuff and trying to find minutes here and there, but well, well, well yeah, like what were some of the things that you were working on? You say working in the, on the key of F, like what exactly were you doing as compared to what's your practice routine now and what you work on? Wow. Well, what I meant by the key of F, I might be playing a song that's in bass in the key of F, but I could have moved it to D flat. <laughs> or, I mean, I, I like to play scales and things in all keys, but uh, still for me, it's, it's repertoire. Obviously, if I'm writing songs, then practicing on those, uh, maybe uh, passages of those kind of compositions, depending on what the, those chords are. Um, and then also just still working on developing the saxophone whether it's crescendo decrescendo or uh, tempos or or just being a, a better saxophonist so if it means uh, some literature that might not be in the jazz vein could be in the classical vein or things like that just to develop uh, the talent but definitely every day trying to work on um, fundamentals um, just to keep the uh, saxophone strong so whether with the students uh, close uh, 25 daily exercise of the saxophone of Sigurd Rasher or um, other uh, uh, Larry Teal, those kind of uh, uh, books like that. But more so now, I would say it's songs, practicing songs, and then I'm writing. And so then that, that might compel me, but then learning, like I say, different uh, songs that you've always wanted to learn, and you try to, to learn that vehicle. And uh, that's what kind of keeps you busy. And then sometimes you go back on some pieces that you used to play and you realize I don't really remember them and you go back right because you, if you don't play something if you don't um, perform it you tend to forget you forget conversations you forget books that you've read so I go back and I've read books over and over that things that really spoke to you because you want that inspiration again yeah and you know it's funny <clears throat> you revisit whether it's an old piece that you worked on or you revisit an old book and sometimes like sometimes you get like oh you get a different perspective like i always say this too like you know something that i i've transcribed many years ago love the song whatever every time i listen to it i hear something different you know it's just it's just the evolution of of hearing um and when you read a really good book that really spoke to you and you read it years later it's going to speak to you in a different way absolutely i i used to i still do like to have fun with myself i I'll get a recording that I think I've heard a zillion times. And I mean, I've listened to it maybe a couple hundred times. And I said, okay, I'm going to challenge myself to find something in there that I've never heard before. And every time you find something, there's always more to be found in books or these uh, recordings because there's, there's so much going on because one thing is affected by another. There's the saxophonist or the trumpet trombonist is affected by maybe something that the, the drummer does or by what the piano does or isn't the piano affected by the drums or the bass is affecting all of them and uh, maybe an articulation or some phrasing or some different aspect of it you can always find something more in it in this piece of music whatever it is yeah and you know this is gonna okay so this is gonna lead to um a question from laura but also a question from me what would one you know you talk to your students and stuff um and even for you actually what's one maybe i'll call it a foundational exercise what's one thing that if you only had 30 minutes a day to practice um you know each day what's one foundational thing that you must hit and you know th that you'd also recommend for your students of any age Ah, mm. oh, wow that's tough um only one thing I might say chromatics because if you do chromatics you get it all in if you play a B flat and two octaves or a B flat you well, know saxophone three octaves is tough but say you do a, a F to F and two octaves or F to B flat two and a half 
uh, you know, on just within the range of the saxophone normal range, then you get every note in. So if you practice chromatics, that way you get them all in. But the chromatics can be practiced in minor thirds. That's what I was going to ask you how to how to do that. So it's not just like long tones. It's not just playing them up and down. So you. Do I'm not it. saying da 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 da. You could do that. Da 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 da. You could do it that way too, or you can play uh, flat nines. You can play F to F sharp, a G to a G sharp, or a G sharp to an A. But that's still chromatics because you're getting all the notes in. So I would say practice something that you can utilize all twelve notes. Because if you just practice one scale major scale maybe missing some other notes but if you do a chromatic you're getting all 12. okay and that's so interesting no one's ever ever actually uh you know suggested that before so that's really really interesting um and you, and you know can practice chromatics and in, in triplets you could do all kinds of things i'm sorry i cut you off though go ahead no 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 this is this is great because again no one no one's ever actually suggested that before and and you know uh people would normally say look like long tones or um uh you know uh yeah mostly long tones and stuff like that so this this is really cool now let me ask you this question because she um this is from laura again advice for amateur jazz musicians um what what do you place the most emphasis on when helping students with jazz improvisation is the language learning standards repertoire technique um you know so what would your advice be for amateur jazz musicians again of of any age listen you got to listen to the music listen 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 and the more you listen and sing with it you can translate it to your instrument the more b dot da 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 da do ba da ba do do li da after a while b dot ba b dot ba you put to the saxophone da da there's only 12 possibilities that's right. Beat up, Bob. So to me, you have to listen and sing. Yeah, and I just wrote that down. Listen and sing for sure. Just in, and that's how you that's how you taught yourself. You know, it's it's so. I mean, that's how we all do. We we mimicked our parents when they were. We listened to what they were saying when we were young people, and we mimicked them until we got our own ability to start working on the English language. But you have to listen first, I think. Absolutely. And, and that's awesome. And um, now the question uh, from Laura, one piece of advice for older jazz students that may be different um, from advice you would give to younger students, or is there going to be a difference? Listen. Same thing. <laughs> I, I mean, you have to listen. If you and I had five minutes right now and uh, we couldn't practice, we would say, what, what can we do? We'll just put on a record. And the reason I keep saying listen, because that's how you get inspired. Yeah. So the, the inspiration is in listening to, when I mention a certain name to you, your eyes light up because you're inspired by thinking about them. If you say Nat King Cole or Louis Armstrong or uh, Dizzy Gillespie, right? Your, your eyes light up because you think about Thelonious Monk, what it is to hear those artists, but you gotta listen. Bleep. Bleep 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 booty da bleep 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 booda bleep 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 that's I'm not in the right key this time but bleep 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 you have to listen to it so you can understand okay there's a gliss bleep 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 it's not dot dot bleep bleep so you have to listen to get the um the phraseology or to get the the, the, the way that the notes are being um presented. And I don't know how you can do that if you don't listen to the art form. I mean, Jay Z, he knows the history of his of what his um, genre is because he's listening to everybody. So he knows the different inflection, uh, and and the different you know basketball players know the different way that uh, Akeem Olajuwon used his pivot foot versus Kareem Abdul Jabbar Jabbar versus Shaquille O'Neal. They make a study. And I think that's what the, the musician has to do. We have to make a study. What's the difference between Miles Davis's note and Clifford Brown's note or Kenny Durham's note? Not that you want to sound like them, but it's, it's great to put them under the microscope. And, and one day you may want to make a, a boatload of money about having um, a critical 
uh, analysis of these things. So if we want to we want to make a boatload of money, we got to do a boatload of research. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and right. yeah. and you know I'm curious too because when again when you're growing up, you you wore out those those you wore out your record play, you wore out the records and stuff. You were listening, you know, you were listening at speed. So my question to you is, you know, you're giving the advice to someone who's listening to this podcast or you know is in school or you know one of your students in school, whatever. Um, listen. Do you have qualms about people slowing things down or do you feel that they need to hear it, you know, at speed? I slowed it down. Oh, okay. Yeah, somebody's going, blah, 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 slow it down. Blah, 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 Why would you not slow it down? Be, oh, that's cheating. No, it's not. If you don't have any ears and you don't, haven't developed your ears, you got to get it the best way you can. So, yeah, slow it down until you, that's like saying, when you're two years old, tie your shoes at real time. That makes no sense. You tie your shoes at the speed that it took 15 minutes to tie your shoes. Then when you were 10, you tied them like that. So I hear people saying, oh, that's cheating. No, it's not. You got to get it done. You got to look in the mirror and be honest with yourself. I need to slow this bad boy down. That's like saying you want to practice exercise at metronome equals 100 when it should be metronome equals 40. Hmm. Because just because you can do something fast, doesn't mean you can do it slow. So you have to be able to do that bad boy slow. Then when you speed up and you have a faster ear, then it's easier for me to pick up a, a, a phrase, but you have to develop that skill. So no, I, I definitely, I slowed it down. My father had a record player and we went from 16 and a, a six, it was 33 to 16 and a half. Oh, wow. Because a record player, you know, had, you could slow it down and so, but the only thing about that, you slowed it down and it slowed it down by an octave. Yeah, yeah. When you slowed it down, it, it went down an octave, but it was harder to make out some of the notes if it was a tenor because it got kind of muddy with all these other instruments in there. So sometimes it, it can be difficult. But now I know students use YouTube and there's certain areas in there where you can slow it down and it keeps the, um, the pitch at the same, doesn't lower the octave or anything. So no, I mean, I don't think you, once you become a, a seasoned, uh, artist maybe you won't have to do it as much but uh, the bottom line is you're still using your ear to me i call it cheating if you get a transcription because somebody else has already done the work now if you want to use the transcription maybe as a as a way to, as a gauge to see how accurate you were if you are convinced that that person's were uh transcriptions is accurate how many people get the the, the real book and get up jump spring and has the wrong chords in there. Well, I know that because I play with Freddie Hubbard. The chords are wrong. So some songs in the real book, you can't trust that the person did the work, did accurate work. So it always depends on who did the, the uh, transcription. But I just, I don't subscribe to to that notion. How about you? Do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? I, no, you, you absolutely. And it, it reminds me, you know, when I was studying and I always thought, oh, it's in the real book. This has to be right. <laughs> but, you know, it, like I, I'd be listening to jazz as I'm driving to school back and forth. And then I look at the real book and, and I don't know why it, I, I would play it the way I heard it. And it didn't occur to me that if I played it the way I read it, that's not what's what people are singing. You know, and and it, it it just I don't know how to, to to describe this in words, but um, the real book is a great resource because it's it's you know um it has all these tunes and all that kind of thing, but um no one ever says to you at first you've got to use your ears first you you know and um it, it's interesting with the heart connection because one of the big things with my background I I have uh, I'm certified in music learning theory and one of the first courses I took uh, was from Chris Azara at Heart summer school i was teaching in, in public schools and um over summer school i took creativity through improvisation with christopher azaro he's not part of heart but he he's part of the uh, eastman school of music and okay. he is certified music learning theory and i know at heart you know many i took many courses that uh, were related to music learning theory or john firebrand's method and that kind of thing but mm -hmm. it was all that was the first time anybody ever said to me ears before eyes sound before sight you right. know and i was doing that kind of stuff um subconsciously but no one no one says that you know so um when it comes to transcriptions like for me personally you know i try to work as much as i can by ear and then if i need to like just check you know maybe i'm off by a half step with a note but then do i trust 
where it's coming from, the transcription. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Yeah, and I hear people saying things, not to call anybody out, but since we're talking about these kinds of things, I hear people saying, oh, don't pat your foot when you're playing music. Well, you clearly haven't been to my church, the church that I used to have, the church we have to go to, everybody's in there patting their foot. Why do they pat their feet? Because it feels good. You feel rhythms, yeah. You don't go, you don't go hear James Brown and expect not to pat your feet. So why would you go hear um, Louis Armstrong and not expect to want to pat your feet? You're supposed to sit there stoic. So there's these kind of things that talk about the way jazz is supposed to be felt and interpreted. It has nothing to do with where how it was created and the way it was meant to be uh, appreciated. And so when people say that stuff is corny. You're supposed to not tap your foot when you play music. That just doesn't make sense. I hear people say, well, don't pat your foot when you, you shouldn't pat your foot. Well, Thelonious Monk pat his, patted his foot. Yeah. Every drummer's patting their foot for you when they put the drum on two and four. Although I pat on one and three, but the drummer keeps time. He's patting his foot or she every time they do two and four. But then we're not supposed to want to click our fingers or clap. It's ridiculous. And so the music becomes um something other than being extemporaneous it becomes a little bit uh uh well i don't even say it about classical music because classical music uh western classical music there's a lot of feeling there too and there's no there's nothing wrong with movement but i just feel people have these uh, uh strategies about how the music should be what we should do as performers and you can't tell any performer and i do think sometimes maybe a little uh depending on the person some movement becomes a little maybe over the top but if that's how that person feels it fine too but the idea of saying you just should never pat your foot that just doesn't make sense to me yeah and you know what's interesting too i, I think you know I'm, I'm classically trained and i i, I always used to I would watch, especially a lot of the woodwind musicians, and they would be moving so much as they're playing these woodwind quintets and all that kind of stuff. And at first I was like, wow, that's, that's kind of, that was kind of weird. And then I realized they're feeling the music and, and they're feeling the music in, um, in a different way. And again, with music learning theory, one of the things that we do, you know, we, we, we get students to feel the music. It's not just tapping your foot. It's, it's moving freely to what you're feeling with the music it's hard to explain it's you just have to kind of experience it but right. you know um it, it's long as you know if that's what the person is feeling that's that's definitely what a, what a person is feeling that's fine you know that people shouldn't be putting you know judgment down or anything like that for sure yeah i mean again i, I grew up you know my my father was a, a church of god in christ and my mother was baptist so it'd be hard for me to go into a church, one of those churches and tell everybody, okay, do the music. Don't anybody pat their foot. The musicians or the, <laughs> the congregation, nobody pat their foot and let's feel it. It's impossible. And that's not the tradition that this music comes out of. Jazz music comes out of that tradition. So you don't have to be like them, but you have to appreciate that that's where it comes from. Absolutely. Now, I want to get to a couple of other things here. Um, the first thing is uh, congratulations for being nominated for uh, an NAACP Image Award for um, a recent album. I think it was from last year, but it was The Gospel According to Nikki Giovanni. And, and Nikki Giovanni is a poet. So congratulations for that. And can you talk about how you met her, how this project came to fruition? Right. Well, being at the University of Hartford, when I got there during the Black History Month, celebrations over the years first couple of years I, I i wanted to contribute uh and help out the university because i felt uh, quite honestly maybe a little bit more could be done so i would invite different um, artists and scholars well dr cornell west happens to be a friend and a mentor so he came the first year i had this idea and the next year i reached out to uh, sister sonia sanchez another incredible poet as well and then i reached out to uh, Dr. Angela Davis, who came, the, Angela Wire Davis, who came the next year, and she received an honorary doctorate the year after she came. Then we brought her back to get an honorary doctorate. Then um, reached out to Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. So these are all African American scholars and political science um, folks, if you will. And then I reached out to Nikki um, at, in that order. And then Nikki came and received an honorary doctorate as well. And we met when we were in the audience <clears throat> in the auditorium. There was some music being played in the auditorium, and it happened to be Charlie Hayden and Hank Jones 
they did a record called Steal Away, which is spirituals. And uh, she had heard it, she thought, but she just really enjoyed hearing the spirituals. And uh, we were just having conversations about that. She said, I'd love to hear more of that. And I said, well, maybe I'll uh, come up with something, an idea or something like that. And she said, okay. Went and had dinner. She went home and two or three days later, I said, wow, uh, I'm going to call her and ask her if she'd pick 10 spirituals for me and that'd be my next recording. So I emailed her and she came back with, I love it. She sent me the 10 selections and those 10 selections are what we recorded. So I, the gospel according to Nikki Giovanni in terms of those are her 10 selections. That's awesome. And yeah, I was listening to those and they're really, it really, it's a great album. And um, I understand that you're going to have another project. Right. We've had a lot of uh, good, good uh, support and a lot of uh, positive feedback, let's say it like that. And uh, so she and myself are going to go back in and record again. I would like to have more of her poetry on the next one fused with the music where there was one piece on this one so i want more of that and then she has some other ideas of some pieces and on that cd she had never uh sung ever well she was very close friends with uh nina simone so the one there's one piece on that is not a spiritual and it's uh, called night song and it was one of uh nikki said that uh, nina loved to uh, perform this piece and it's from the uh the musical golden boy so she sang on our rendition N nikki did so we'd like to do more and have her sing she's got a this a, a really warm and fragile voice so i love to have her be more involved on this project as opposed to just picking selections i just want her um her voice and her um her words um spoken from her as part of the next CD, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And and you know, what's really interesting to me, you said like her voice is like warm and, and fragile, right? And so how does that influence you as a performer? You're performing on this piece, right? You're, she's singing or, or it, does it influence how you approach, you know, your interpretation? Right. Well, when we did this, um, that we did it, it's, it's a slow piece. So we recorded it and we left a space for her. And then we went down to Virginia, myself and the engineer, where she lives, and she we rented a studio time there, and she came in and and uh, sang uh, her lyric. But I will say that the piece itself was a, is a very warm, a fragile piece. So as a as a as a musician, I wanted to evoke the same kind of um, passion or the same kind of empathy in that same way. And so then Nikki came in, did it the same way. So you're right, depending on what the piece is and um, what we're trying to achieve, although I still think it all should be warm, even though it can be fast, it can still be warm. You know what I mean? But it, uh, uh, but sometimes you do want things, you're right, to have a little more edge, but I still feel warmth is always um, achievable, just especially with my tone. I try to make it a warm, uh, inviting uh, tone that will work with any kind of uh, style or tempo or uh, whatever that is. But you're right, you're definitely influenced by other musicians or other people that might be involved that might have that kind of uh, uniqueness in that way. Yeah, and, and yeah, and that's, that's what I'm getting at too. Like, you know, you've performed, you know, with other singers as well, you know, Joanne, you know, and other uh, musicians as well, but, um, do you find yourself being influenced, you know, like, let's say you, you're working with a singer that that is more edgy or whatever the case may be. Do you find that your improvisation at that moment becomes more edgier? Do you know what I'm saying? I do. Well, yeah, sure. You because uh, you're uh, not a prisoner of the moment, but you do want to kind of uh, allow yourself to be influenced by what your musical surrounding would be in that moment. So you're right, depending on who you're with and how they might push allows you to push in another way. And that's why we play music together so we can be inspired by each other. So uh, you're right, depending on who you're with. I mean, um, Betty Carter produced my first uh, recording on Blue Note and uh, she would come and sit in with us from time to time. And Betty could be way laid back on a ballad, but then on a certain song that be up tempo, she could be edgy and she could push you. So you're right in that situation. I had to do my best to keep up with her 
<laughs> in terms of edge. So I, 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 uh, I agree with what you're saying there. Yeah, thank you. And um, it's just, you know, it's, it's again, it's that interaction, you know, it's, it's, and you had mentioned before, too, you know, you're doing your work in the practice room. Uh, but when you're on the stage, you're performing, you're interacting, that's that group, that group kind of interaction that's going on there, for sure. Um, now, another album also was a tribute to John Coltrane as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm curious about that. And again, super fan Laura was also interested in that as well. What was the inspiration for making that album? Well, as you know, we have so many heroes that uh, influence, influence us in the music and uh, John Coltrane is one of my heroes. And uh, I did a lot of touring with uh, Jimmy Cobb, who did play with uh, John Coltrane quite a bit. So we did this tour and um, just kind of had the idea to go in the studio and play songs that were associated with John Coltrane and songs that he wrote. So some of the pieces that I did on that recording were pieces that he didn't write, write, but we associate sometimes my one and only love with John Coltrane. Although we did Naima, he wrote that, or um, Like Sonny, he wrote that. But just some other pieces we played, uh, Sunday My Prince Will Come, where he's kind of associated with that rendition that I think of when I think of Miles Davis. So it was an idea to kind of honor him and uh, pieces that Jimmy Cobb was a part of with John as well. So most of the pieces that we did, if I remember right, were pieces that Jimmy was actually on the recordings with John, which made it um, uh, a particular meaning too, because uh, you have him there who was part of, of both uh, time periods and to kind of get um, a sense of from him of, of the goal of the piece at that time, or the, maybe the, some 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 uh, backstory on the uh, recording. So that that's what made it really fruitful is to have Jimmy on it. That's awesome. Um, in in terms of uh, actually, the question I have for you is this too: Have you considered doing an album based on your early mentors like I'm, i keep thinking about gene ammons have you thought about that because that was like one of the first albums that you got i have not i mean that's something i could uh like you say put on the list and <laughs> <laughs> see how that comes in but you know gene ammons is he's such a, a giant uh but you're right in terms of how that would honor gene and obviously uh my father because that was his favorite that's something to but i haven't thought about that but it's not not out of realm of possibility let's say it like that here, yeah here. That's, that's awesome so what um what other projects do you have coming up this year to 2023 well like i said myself and nikki are working on getting back in the studio and and uh coming up with another um uh, recording there's a couple other uh like really outside uh the uh outside of the ballpark ideas that I am thinking about, but I don't want to share it because I don't want anybody else to do it. <laughs> but I am thinking of something that's really, really unique and no one's actually done it. So um, um, that's something that I'm, I'm actually working on that now. And uh, we can uh, pivot back together on that. But and I haven't seen anyone do this um, project that I'm thinking about. So I want to try to do that. Oh, that's a, that's <laughs> piqued my curiosity and the listener's curiosity for sure. That's awesome. All right. Well, let me ask you this question because I, I want to honor your time. Um, what, where can people find you? Again, we're going back to social media, but where can people find you online? Right. Well, the uh, CD with Nikki uh, is on any platform that you might want to look for. It's on Amazon. It's on uh, was it Spotify, wherever you want to uh, buy music, you can find it. Uh, most of the cds are on some online platform that you can get them and on my website um, because the last including the one with nikki i licensed it but it's on my uh solid jackson record label so if you contact me about anything you want we'll get you um, a signed copy through the website javonjackson.com if and you can email me there but all of the music that i've um, recorded it unless way way back but now everything is on youtube every everything but if you want to have the full you know package of it then that can be arranged yeah for sure well listen one uh one way to to tie this in is that you know from i'm thinking from mentee to mentor you know like the the influence that 
um, that older mentors have had on you throughout your life from your dad, you know, to, to Art Blakey, to, to, you know, to Jimmy Cobb, to all these people that you've worked with. And now you're passing that on, you know, through your playing, through your teaching. I think that's really inspiring. Well, you know, um, somebody gave it to them and they gave it to us and we have to give it to somebody else. And Art Blakey would always say, you can't complain about the music or you can't complain about the musicians playing the music if you're not trying to help them. So you can't complain about the way something's going if you're sitting on the sidelines. But if you want to get in this and get in the game and try to help them along, then we 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 all need to do our part to to pay it forward at some point. Otherwise, um, it's kind of a selfish notion where you're trying to hoard all the information. You got to share the information and then allow them that next generation as in them to give it to the next generation and so forth and so on. Cause someone had to, someone had to give us a shot. Yeah. Yeah. So then why would we, why wouldn't we want to give somebody else a shot? Yeah. And just, and giving it to the next generation and seeing how they transform it. And, you know, it's, it's definitely transformed, you know, um, you know, a, a lot, especially in the last, you know, I'd say decade and such, but, um, listen, Javon, I want to thank you for, you know, being generous with your time, but also generous with your, with your sharing, you know, when you're sharing with your tips and all that kind of thing. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Again, congratulations on all the uh, success you've been having, and uh, I wish you more.